And hello once again, this is uh, LC Lupus, uh, and this is the second video of the uh, Utopian project. I, I had originally tried to think of something else it could be called, but I was like, you know what, a Utopian project. That, that seems pretty, um, you know, honest about what the, the idea is, so let's just, let's just go with that. Now, this is the first video that goes into more actual tangible specifics. Um, there were a few ex like users example sort of specifics in the previous video, but the previous video was more about uh, a general philosophy of, of how we were going to be looking at this more utopian idea. So basically, this is an attempt to look at what could be a potential sort of not necessarily perfect world, but a, a better world that would be just better to live in. Um, this video is all about housing and communal living. So basically, we are going to be looking at work, the idea of work as in jobs, um, urbanization, <clears throat> housing itself, and how it's allocated, and then things like, say, art, learning, festivals, the library economy, uh, and then allowances and uh, deliverables. Those kind of things. So, in, in very, very brief... The idea is that this should be a more communal society. So cities are highly densely packed cities. Uh, cities are densely packed cities, yes. They're very, very densely packed <clears throat> communal centers. However, people do not really um, have any kind of a, of a communal existence within such places. Also, you might hear... Um, Kayla in the background, she is a very old puppy who stays with me and who I've known for many, many years. She is blind and mostly deaf. Hey, Kate. If she barks at some point, it's just because she's saying hi. So, anyway, communal living. Cities and the way we currently set things up just don't really work because we intentionally segregate ourselves. Yes, Kayla. No. Do you, do you not agree with the topic? Anyway, I don't think Kayla much agrees with, with talking about this, but as we obviously know, all dogs are pretty much hardcore, like, fascists. So, you know, she doesn't believe anybody deserves anything. Anyway, so, um, how to set up a society? Okay, so, the way we live now, highly segregated, we, for instance, there's no legal segregation along, for instance, racial lines. But we still have often racially segregated societies. Um, you know, in America, this is because of things like redlining uh, and because of lovely old Jim, uh, Jim Crow era stuff in, say, South Africa. Uh, it's because apartheid ended in 1994, which was less than 30 years ago. And back then there were sort of whites only and blacks only and coloreds only. Uh, designations where people could live. And the thing is, what happens is, if you are designated a white or a black or a colored or a whatever, you are then placed into sort of where you're allowed to live. They say, this is the only place you're allowed to live. And the thing about, you know, this is why you get a lot of sort of racists who don't understand things will say, I know, but why, why haven't black people, you know, they've had like nearly 30 years. Why haven't they blah, blah, blah. And it's because if your entire, like for decades, your family was put into a certain place where they then bought homes, which means that they, it's now, there's roots now where you live in these now poor areas. You are sort of forced to live there for decades on end. And then as soon as apartheid ends, they're like, oh yes, no, everybody is now equal. Um, however, all the people who have educations are white people and they all live in white areas. Um, which are now obviously legally not white areas. Of course, black people can live in, in a white area. Of course they can, if they can afford it, which is equal. Remember, it's, it's equal. If you don't have money, that's, that's, that's obviously just because you didn't work hard enough. Right? Uh, the, the, the moment apartheid ends, if you, didn't, if you as a black person didn't become like a businessman, then obviously you, you just don't work as hard as, as me, um, who who was um, 
given a job because my father owns a company and um and I was put into a university which my father paid for uh yeah so sort of that you could go into racial segregation for ages but the way society is currently laid out we do segregate not just based on on race but also based on class we all know in our you know areas wherever we happen to live that there are rich areas and there are poor areas we segregate it's it's mostly the rich who segregate themselves away from everybody else but the segregation exists and we sort of do it to ourselves we also of course because of uh the only sense of communal living we have now if say you are from a more marginalized group or say you're from an immigrant group a lot of this why in a lot of countries immigrants tend to live in in sort of the same kind of group it's why in say the united states there's places like chinatown or little italy where you know decades ago or even centuries ago when um when immigration was in full swing in those areas that's where sort of they were placed they were like oh yeah you live here with the other italians with the other chinese people you live here and of course it's going to then stay that way because people lay down roots they live there uh they they my own homes or they they have work there they have family there if they leave then they're not part of that community anymore they lose that support structure so it's dangerous to leave it's dangerous to go out on your own um and that is the kind of thing that happens but that is a problem the fact that 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 is the way things can be is is a massive problem so in a more utopian society people would effectively just be given homes there is no segregation everybody has the same kind of home however home sizes should of course be different between certain groups for different reasons and really i would i would say it's because of family size now family i will not define along biological terms um a family could be say two people who want to live together either are or are not romantically attached two or more people there could be five people who want to live in the same house um and they are none of them are romantically attached to any of them that i would still say could be considered a type of family but that at the moment is done out of necessity like you have roommates because you can't afford rent in a city that's why you have a roommate usually you don't usually have a roommate because like oh are you really bad we want to have a roommate you have a roommate because you can't afford to not in this society you would be given a home based on family size so if say you had a kid well then you should have another room because that kid is a human being who deserves to have their own room if you have another kid then you should be moved to a new house with another room because every kid should have their own room you shouldn't un- unless of course you for some reason specifically want your kids to share until a certain age uh, i would say especially once say they become teenagers or something then they should definitely have their own rooms um but homes would be given based on that not based on on what you do you know in this society it would be proper communism which is not how it was like in say the USSR surgeons did make more money than janitors but in this society everybody would have the same kind of home and everything would be communal living so let's say i uh, so i'm giving a home and also homes don't need to have a lot of the things the sort of the bells and whistles um that homes have now because of communal areas so a lot of communal areas will be things like say eateries when i i think that there there should definitely be special allotments for people especially say if somebody has disabilities or struggles to to leave a lot or of course has very very young children then having to go to a communal eating center all the time might be difficult but for most people you can have a communal eat and you not not need a kitchen and if it's open 24 hours a day then then that's the way it is so you could be like okay i'm going to go to the 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 communal eatery and there's always food there and i'll go there and i'll be like listen this is the kind of food that i i would like and they'll say here's your food and that's just the way it works and those people and here's the other thing you get a lot of people especially privileged people who will be uh now i don't want to swear on any of my on any of these videos but um people who will be uh jerks let's use a nice term jerks to waiting staff 
to waiters, to kitchen staff, all those kind of people. They'll just be rude to them, mean to them, uh, terrible human beings. Uh, in this society, uh, you could be that person because it could be one of your, what are called, societal functions. Now, here's where we get into jobs. Jobs should be split along essentially two lines. You get societal functions and you get passions. Now, a societal function is now a thing that we've been we've been kind of brainwashed by capitalism to believe is that oh no, no uh, work should be something that makes you fulfilled, which is such a sort of a middle class and upper class mentality of of saying oh no work should make you you happy like the work itself should make you happy. And it's like you know that it's easy to say that when you I don't know like a, working in marketing in some office it's easy to say that. Uh, it's it's not as easy to say that when you do trash collection, when you're a waiter, that it, you you nobody expects you to be like oh usually we'll say a waiter has to put on a happy face, but no one really thinks a waiter is like oh I'm so thrilled to be doing this job, where a lot of people treat me like trash. So, in this sense, a societal function are the jobs that need to be done, and every single person has to do societal functions. So, obviously, once again, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. If you, for instance, have uh, a disability, something like, say, paralysis, paralysis of the legs, so you're in a wheelchair, you cannot be expected to be a street sweeper because that is very sort of physical. You're, you're moving around a lot. You have to walk a lot of places. That would just be unfair to expect you to do that. However, you could, if say that was what was what is uh, what your disability is, you can work in the communal eatery. You can be a person who does things like cutting up um, the the food, you know, in preparation for uh, putting it in dishes. Um, there are so many things that you could do other than just that. It could also be that you are a person that. Um, is in some way a, a helper to, to others. So say a person that is, let, let's say when there is um, some kind of a construction happening and you need people to be like, oh, just be careful of this area. Somebody who is both disabled or not disabled is able to do a job like that. Now, of course, it does depend on the level of disability. You can expect somebody, say, in a wheelchair to be able to do something like that, but say somebody who has full, like sort of paraplegic paralysis, so arms and legs, you can't exactly expect them to be able to do something like that. However, a lot of the time that is not something that is uh, that you're born with generally. So someone like that could, for instance, teach. They could do something that is, is purely a, a mental activity, not something that requires... Uh, the use of arms or legs. Because also the thing is, in terms of now, being, say, a garbage collector, your job is way, 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 way more important than an accountant. You are more important than an accountant. Because you know what happens when the trash stops being collected? Everything stinks. It's a very important job. Making food, very important jo job. Yet people get treated like trash who do it. Being a cashier, important job. People get treated like ca like 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 cash. People get treated like trash for doing it. In this sense, everybody will be assigned a job. You won't be expected to love it. But also, because everybody has to do these jobs, these societal functions, these are jobs that are societally necessary. That, no, they're not fun. But, because in, in, right now, a trash collector, for instance, does, does not feel fulfilled. They don't feel like they're doing something to really contribute to the world, even though they are. And that's because they're paid terribly, they're treated terribly. But now, if everybody had to do trash collection at some point in their lives, then, well, we all do know that trash collection is, is important. We all know it. And so... Doing these societal functions, you will know that this is something that needs to be done for society to function. There is meaning in your work. Even if it's terrible work, there's meaning in it. And now the other thing is that you will not be forced into it forever. 
jobs, these societal functions, should be on a rotational basis. So let's say it would be like this. You have to spend six months as a trash collector. And also, of course, because actually there's a lot of people, and there isn't actually that much work that needs to be done, the work week can be massively shrunken down to about three days and a four-hour session. If everybody does that at different times, and also say, say your one week, your first week, you work from um, 8 and then 9 to 11. Uh, you know, so 8 to 12, right? You work 8 to 12. The next week, you work 12 to 4. The next week, you work 4 to 8. And so you see, everybody does have to do essentially the midnight shift at some point. Everybody is doing this. And then once, say, your six months are done, then they're like, okay, cool. Your next societal function is now you're going to be working in agriculture. And you'll just kind of be shifting through these the whole time. Doing different societal functions where everybody has to do these jobs that have to be done. But one of the reasons for this is because what if, for instance, you end up becoming quite good at whatever it is that the societal function is. And you want to then stay longer in that societal function to train others to be better at it. That is something that you can do. But you can't just not do it. Everybody has to do it. And this is where... So those are your societal functions. So, you know, four hours a, a, a day, three days a week, which is not a lot of, of work, you know. Cool. And obviously also, of course, the, the level of your work will change. So let's say a 20-year-old shouldn't really be teaching. Not because, like, they can't. You know, I'm in my late 20s and I'm a teacher. But let's say when it comes to teaching, uh, let's say you get really good at agriculture and you want to help the younger people be better at it. You shouldn't be doing that when you're 20 because when you're 20 is when you're generally at your physically strongest. The older you get, the more your work should naturally shift from more physical work to more mental work. Because the older you get, the more, you know, the, the, the weaker your body gets. We all know that this happens to us. But now that is... Societal functions. So what are passions? Passions are the other things. The things that you actually want to do with your life. What do you actually want to do? Do you want to just learn? Do you want to, to read? Do you want to teach? Do you want to be in academia? Do you want to do like create things? Do you want to be an artist? Do it. You can have the rest of the time to do it. Or do you want to just do nothing? Then do that. It's up to you. Your passion is entirely up to you. Now, also this would, because this is essentially not a capitalistic society, a lot of jobs would just be eliminated, utterly just gone, okay? So you don't need to be like, oh, no, no, but we're, 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 if, if, everybody, if everybody has to do um, trash collection, then, then what, what, about, what about the poor, poor supermarket managers? They won't need to be supermarket managers. So they don't, that job doesn't need to exist. Oh, what about the people who do copywriting for business? That doesn't need to exist anymore. Oh, uh, what about salesmen? No, nope. salesmanship is, is inherently predatory. That does not need to exist anymore. It, it really doesn't. Uh, if there's no money, there's no need for sales. So those kind of jobs disappear. And now the workforce is huge. And so everybody only has to do a little bit of really, really horrible work. Because a lot of these jobs are horrible. They are. But that is, they're necessary. Right? And also, let's say, you then get put into certain things. So you get to say, oh, you're going to be a plumber for a year. You then learn from somebody who knows how to do plumbing. And now you have learned plumbing. And then you become an electrician for a while. And you help doing that. That is sort of the things that need to be done. But that, that could be considered boring by a lot of people. But that's what has to be done. So passions are things like, you know, learning and art. And, and there will no longer be a... Because at the moment, there is a very, very real concern when, say, you are a, a philosophy major. Yes, yes, I have, a, I have a master's degree in philosophy. And then you will always get somebody who says this to you. Uh, are you going to get a job with that? Are you going to make money with that? It's, that's not the point. The point of education is not just to get a job. 
Like you have an immensely capitalistic mindset if that's your perspective. If you think that learning must lead to money. Learning should not lead to money. Learning should be a thing that you do because you want to learn. If you want to learn, then you want. If you don't, then you don't. And that's why passions are different. So let's say people in academia, right? Which is sort of like an area that I'm going towards, like me personally. I do not. That, that, that is not like a societally necessary thing. I would love if I was, if they had said, okay, cool. So you, you want to do this like literature stuff, which no, doesn't have like a societal function. Cool. That's a passion. But then four hours a week, three days a week, uh, if, I mean, three hours a day, three days a week, you have to do, you know, you're going to be a plumber for the next year until you do something else. I'll be like, and the rest of the time I get to be an academic and I get to be a writer and I get to be the things that I love doing. Like, yes, of course you can do whatever the hell you want. Then that's what I'll do. I will be able to pursue art. I'll be able to pursue the things that I want to do with my life. The societal functions need to be done. And as I said in the previous video, we need to look at the technology that exists now. Maybe one day in the future there'll be robots that can do all the jobs for us, but that is not the way things are. So people have to have work. People have to do the bad jobs. But everybody has to do the bad jobs. People don't get to get away with it. You don't get to never get your hands dirty. And also... Coming from me, when it comes to the, the, the uh, when I use the term getting your hands dirty, I mean literally like agriculture, like getting your hands into dirt, into the ground. That is something that freaks me out so much because I have a texture thing. I compulsively wash my hands. However, your personal comfort in that particular sense is kind of less important than the societal necessity of the job. And because you will know that I'm doing this, yes, my hands are getting dirty, I can clean them later, but I know that by doing this, I am helping to produce food for everybody. Food that doesn't go to waste, food that doesn't go to a supermarket, and then when it doesn't get sold, it gets thrown into the trash rather than being given to people. So that is what should be done there. And then when it comes to things like, it's called the library economy, right? The library economy, which I briefly mentioned in the previous video, is the idea that um, the library economy is a library system for everything. So do I need like tools? Well, we only make a, a few sets. We only have a few sets of very, very high quality tools that can be taken out whenever they are needed. Uh, I need to... Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to say go on a, a road trip. Let's just say, I want to go on a road trip because actually we're going to get into like, um, which, which video is it? The fourth video? Fourth video goes into transportation. But let's say I, I want to go on a road trip. People don't need to have cars in a society because public transport will be a bit, which will be go, the fourth video is going to go into that very, very in depth. But let's say I want to go on a road trip just because I you know want to. Then I can take out a car that is a more environmentally friendly car because Obviously, in the society, the few cars that do actually exist would obviously need to be in some way green vehicles. And then when I'm done with it, I return the car because it's not my car. And you don't need to have a car. You personally do not need to have a car. It's only for when you want to use it, because why would you need to use it unless your job necessitates it? So I would say, you know, a job that requires you moving around a lot. So, so a societal function that requires you going around to a lot of places. That, yes, sure, having a vehicle, that makes sense. Most people don't. If there's good public transport, people do not need to have their own vehicles. It's unnecessary to have. So that's the library economy. So nobody really has massive possessions in their homes. Like it's unnecessary because it's unnecessary to have so many things. Like say having expensive pots and pans, that's not necessary. You can go to the eatery. It'll be there. So that is what this library economy is. And there's a great video by Andrew Wilson, which I will link in the uh, description, which goes into the library economy in much more tangible specifics. And I would recommend checking that out. Now, also, of course, sort of everybody has uh, allowances. And when I say allowances, I don't mean um, monetary allowances, like for your kid. Everybody has an allowance for allowances for what they need. Remember that that very important thing from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. 
which I really should actually just, because I've written it here with the, 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 the masculine pronouns, I should have it with the neuter pronouns. So anyway, um, everybody should have what they need. If you are in need of something, it should be provided to you. If uh, you need dental care, you get dental care. If you need a certain type of food, more so than a different type of food, maybe because of allergies or because of something like that, then that should be provided for you. Now, one thing, because I want this to be very, very specific, because I feel like a lot of people just instinctively forget about it. And that is the ableistic aspect of certain things, like, say, because uh, the idea of this more communal living is that it's a very sort of a city or communal setups with a lot of walkability. So no cars, because cars are terrible. Uh, and people and public transport is just very, very good and always available. That can be difficult for people with disabilities, depending on the severity of the disability. Getting onto public transport can be really, really hard. And that's why things like ride-sharing apps like Uber and stuff are actually really, really useful for a lot of people with disabilities because having to stand around waiting for a, a train and then getting into a, a tightly packed train, that it's not, it's not preferable, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and so there should be allowances to help people with disabilities. So, for instance, if, yes, most people should be going to the communal eatery to get their food. But let's say you have a disability that makes that a bit difficult for you. Well, then food should be delivered to you. It, just simple. You should be accommodated because everybody, basically everybody should be accommodated for their needs. And now, of course, hopefully, now there will always be cynics who will say, oh, the society like this will never work because everybody has to be like good and whatever. Sure. But, you know, I, I choose to have faith in, in humans rather than acting as if they're definitely going to be terrible. Uh, if everybody knows that they should help everybody, then that's sort of... And if you're, you're taught that from a young age, then that's how it's going to be. You know, we, we're taught now, when we go to school, we're taught competition is the most important thing. You have to... It's a zero-sum game. Some people win, some people lose. That is an awful mentality to have. Terrible. Absolutely terrible mentality to have. Yet that is a mentality that so many people do have. People who are like, oh, no, no, there's a, you know, there's a specific way that you have to do whatever. There's, uh, you know, just people were taught things like meritocracy. Meritocracy is the belief that if you work hard, you will succeed, which is nonsense. Rich people do not work hard. They just get things, right? A lot of people who just inherited wealth, they didn't work hard for that wealth. And even, even you'll get some people who say, are effectively self-made or they proclaim themselves to be self-made and you'll be like oh so you're oh like you, you managed to do this all by yourself well done well done and you're like yep yep uh i and a lot of them will either start like this yes i got a small loan from my father and you're like okay immediately that or let's say you didn't get a loan so you're like no no i didn't i never got a loan or anything like that and i i had to pay for my university all that kind of stuff and you're like oh that's that's difficult so yeah you know it was but it was, uh, you know, at least, at least I did have the fact that uh, uh, I had the family home. That was good. And you're like, oh, you were just given property. Okay, yeah. You do know that without property, it means you have no rental costs, which means it's way easier to just live. So different people, in terms of meritocracy, working hard doesn't mean you're going to succeed. It's, it's, it's about what you were given and what, it's about the privileges you have. So if we change the mentality, so say schools stop teaching meritocracy, they stop teaching that competition is the most important thing, they instead teach that cooperation is the most important thing. They teach that altruism is important, not trying to win, not trying to have as much money as possible, but just helping people. That is more important than winning. Like winning is bad. Like I, I do not care for sports. Uh, I find sports personally boring. But I also have a very, very uh, philosophical problem with sport. Because sport, when you're young, you're taught that there's a winning side and a losing side. And then there'll be people who will disparage the idea that, you know, uh, everybody participated. But the thing is, everybody did participate. And winning and losing shouldn't really matter in that sense. And, and also, what? why? Why does it matter who wins? Like, why is that such a... 
an important thing. And people are trained to be competitive. They're trained to want to beat other people. They're trained to be jealous and envious of, of other people's success. If we teach from a young age that that is not the way you should be, then, you know, that's also why, for instance, a lot of young people now are just like less racist and more accepting of people who are, you know, on the LGBTQIA+. So spectrum, people of different races, old people are famously racist. And it's because they were taught from a young age, they were like, oh no, when I went to school, black people weren't allowed to be in the same class as me. If that is your upbringing, then of course you're going to think that black people are inferior to you. So it's all about how you're taught from a young age, about how you are raised. And if you're raised to, to believe that everybody is equal and that everybody should contribute and that competition doesn't matter, and that cooperative uh, cooperation is much more important, then hopefully that is what will happen. Obviously, I might just be an optimist in this sense. I don't consider myself to be an optimist. I tend to be a very pessimistic person. But I want to be optimistic. And so I think that this is something that I want to try to, to hold on to. That if people are taught from a young age not to be jerks, not to be mean, to pull their weight, to contribute, to know that competition doesn't matter, that hopefully that is the case, that people learn to just contribute, to be a, a member of society, to, to not be a terrible person. That is, that's the hope, at least. That's my hope. That's what I hope happens. And also just a, a little, another little small thing. I would, I would kind of want houses to be on stilts. I know this, this sounds a bit weird. Okay, immediately it sounds a bit strange housing on stilts sort of essentially elevate our entire uh, cities, take them off the ground, basically. Kind of create, so they're still underground. Uh, or they're still, still like, they still land beneath us. The reason for that is actually because, say, one of the reasons that society is so difficult for non-human animals, human society is so difficult for non-human animals, is because... We have so many things that can kill them all the time. They're not welcome. And that's why I would actually want human, this more utopian society, to be more of a zoopolis. I, I, I don't actually know how to pronounce that word. I always struggle with it. But in, in the idea that we live with animals, not separate to them, not like, oh, no, we're special, we're unique, but and also not keep them as pets. Like, they can just live with us. We can be part of their their world. But then, of course, also we, we, we elevate ourselves off the ground so that it can still exist below us without us damaging it. Because us putting in all sorts of things really damages the ground and everything. Us ripping up the ground for roads and houses, it's, it's devastating environmentally. So, yeah, and I think just putting things on stilts and basically just putting everything in the air would just be better, which might be a little bit strange. Uh, and then also you would just have to you have to design it in such a way that there's large gaps so that sunlight can still get down there so that things can still grow it's a whole thing that's probably the, the sort of the strangest ideas that, that are going to be in here in this uh, ongoing series but I think that we should try to reintegrate ourselves into nature rather than trying to just separate ourselves from nature and see ourselves as different and superior um, but yeah I think I'm going to end there so that has been um, the second video the next video, I've already closed this document, well done me, um, let me just have a look, the, the next video is going to be called Agriculture, Environmentalism and Animals, I'm going to go more into animals, I know, very, very fun. I hope that this has been, you know, enjoyable, enlightening, I don't really like the word enlightening, it implies that there's some kind of brilliant depth to what I'm talking about, where I really don't think there is, I think I'm just talking about ideas and, 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 and hopefulness so, yeah, uh, but hopefully it's, it's, it's made you think a bit uh, about what could be. Obviously, none of these things are necessarily ever going to happen or even likely to happen. Or maybe they're even just terrible ideas. But I would like a society in which we didn't base everything on competition and where we actually cared about each other and tried to help each other. And, yeah. So, uh, anyway... Uh, that has been LC Lupus. Uh, you can check out the channel. It would be nice if you like, subscribe, comment, do the YouTube things. Uh, you can also check me out. It's also just by the way, Kayla, who uh, spoke to us earlier, if you recall, the beginning of the, the, the video. 
she has now farted and she's sitting right next to me and it smells quite bad and I can't get up because I'm still recording this. <clears throat> so anyway, you could check me out on Twitter at LC underscore lupus and other places, you know, uh, Instagram or what have you. And now also over the next of this year, I'm going to be publishing a whole bunch of books and um, hopefully they're, they're good, enjoyable, whatever. So if you're interested in checking any of those out, then uh, you can check out things in the description, Wolf Dog Publishing. And so far, only one of my books has been published, and it is called The Cyborg Wilderness, which is a environmental, uh, like sort of environmentalist story about a cyborg who survived a cataclysmic and apocalypse-inducing war, and she is now the only being really left, and she journeys the grey wastes trying to find hope. Um, it is not a sad... Okay, it is, I suppose it's a sad, but it's a hopeful story. Um, so you can always check that out. And I think that will be it. So goodbye, and I hope that you have a great day, week, and month ahead. Ta-ta.